Good morning, River's Edge. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 28. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. O oh, save your people and bless your heritage, for their shep- be their shepherd and carry them forever. And we'll have a moment of silent and reverent anticipation before we worship. Dear Heavenly Father, prepare our hearts to worship you this morning and prepare our ears to hear your word as we're we're taught by Ryan this morning. Holy Spirit, speak through him to give us the message that we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen.
and say, I love you. All right, now we'll continue with, with our worship with today's Heidelberg Catechism, which is question 86. And the question is, since we have been delivered from our misery by grace through Christ, without any merit of our own, why then should we do good works? Because, because Christ, Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, is, is also restoring us by his spirit into, into his, his image, image, so that with our whole lives we may show that we are thankful to God for his benefits so that, that he may be praised through us, so, so that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits, and, and so, so that, that by our godly living, our neighbors may be won over to Christ. You may be seated. If the ushers could go ahead and come forward as we pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the freedom to worship you without persecution. We pray that you'd bless our offerings um, as we're obedient in our ties to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Father, we worship you this morning. Thank you for this time to worship and prepare our hearts for your message. God, I pray that you would give us ears to hear this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's all because of Christ, all because he is alive. Why we're here, why we're even able to, to go on. Elaine Higgins is among us. Praise the Lord. <laughs> wow. Some, some people haven't seen, seen you for a couple months, but here you are. So many things going on in our fellowship. Continue to lift one another up and be aware of one another's needs. We're <clears throat> going to speak about that this morning. Um, but I do welcome any visitors among us today to the River's Edge. It's a blessing to have you worshiping the Lord with us and being a part of, of what God is doing among us. If you would turn in your Bible to Psalm 133 this morning, and if you are using one of the Bibles provided, which we have some in the chairs there, it's on page 519, Psalm 133, and we're going to do the whole psalm. So we'll start at verse 1, and we'll go all the way to verse 3, because it's, it's a short one. So some of you are like, wow, this is going to be short, but, but you know better. Maybe through some of you for a loop as well. John was up here earlier, and now I'm up here, kind of opposite of, of usual, but it's good to see him strumming and singing. So we're taking a break this morning from our study in the Gospel of Luke, which has been just wonderful. And if you've missed any of those sermons, I encourage you to go online and, and check those out. If you need, even we could get you a copy on a, a CD, that's a compact disc. Um, probably could figure out getting a tape cassette, if, if you would like. But our study in Luke has been rich. Today we're going to look at something that's been um, on my heart recently, and Pastor John even touched on it briefly last week at the end of the sermon, and that is the idea of unity, and specifically Christian unity is what we're going to speak of today. And so, if you're like me, you're probably suspicious of unity. Unfortunately, um, there's good reason to be suspicious of unity, because we know, well, what, what, are, what are the people's motives? What are, you know, what's, what's really going on in the background, and especially just things that have been happening the last year and a half in our country. But. So for good reason, we may be suspicious of unity, but I want to submit to you today that we should not be suspicious of unity when it comes to the church and in the body of Christ. And so, yes, when it comes to the idea of world peace, as, as wonderful as that sounds, um, we know back in the 1960s, in the the hippie movement, um, the free love movement or whatever it was called, and they had the, these grand ideas, but they were, they were based on a, a sandy foundation, of course, and we've seen horrendous results of a lot of that worldview, unfortunately, and we still do not have world peace 60 years later, so obviously that doesn't work. So this unity I'm going to speak of today is not a new age, um, one collective consciousness type unity that many speak of today and have for a few decades. The idea that we are all one and, and the universe is one and, and we just need to be part of the collective and get back in touch with the, the real us inside or, or any of these kind of ideas that are not found in scripture at all. That kind of unity, just that's not what we want. No, we want true Christian unity. It's been said that to be a Christian is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's true. But this personal relationship is always in relation to others. It's not just me and Jesus, all right? That's one main reason we, we gather in, into the church, 
as believers. Because God has always called a people. We see it with Israel. We see it with the church, which means the gathering, which means the assembly. It takes many of us. We're called the body of Christ, but we are many. We're one, but we are many, members one of another. The Bible also tells us to put on the armor of God that we've been given. And so this means that we are also soldiers in an army and we're in a war. It's an aspect we we forget of or we forget. So we need to be united just as any successful uh, military is. We need to be united in belief and in purpose. But even more than that, we need to be united in love and by love, the love of Christ, sacrificial love. Once again, not the world's idea of love. So we don't want worldly peace, we don't want worldly love, but the love of God. Jesus said this in John 13, 35, right after he washed his disciples' feet, which is just an amazing thing in and of itself, that he would stoop to that level of a servant and wash his disciples' feet. You would think they would wash his feet. But he said this, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We sang it this morning. They'll know we are Christians by our love. And we usually think that means our love for other people and for this world. That's partly true, but Jesus here specifically says they'll know we are Christians by our love for one another. Our love for one another. And there are many aspects of unity. I'm not going to cover them all today. But we're going to start by just looking at Psalm 133 and the blessing of unity. And then later we'll look at some other passages as well. But look here at Psalm 133 in your Bible. And the title says, A Song of Ascents of David. We don't want to just breeze over that. That isn't just a uh, little informational tidbit that doesn't matter. No, it's, it's important. What are the songs of ascent? Some of you may know, but many of you may not. And so just briefly, I want to explain that. Um, Psalm 120 through Psalm 134 are called the songs of ascent. So this is just right toward the end of it in 133. They're also called the pilgrim songs, psalms or songs because the people of God, the Jewish people at the time would go to Jerusalem and they would say they were going up to Jerusalem even if they came from the north or the south or east or west, whatever way, because it was positioned on a high hill and it still is, Jerusalem is. And so they would go up to worship. They would ascend. That's what ascend means. There were three main festivals every year. And so as the Jew made this pilgrimage, they would sing these songs on their way. And we'll see the importance of this aspect in relation to unity as we get into the text. There's also the tradition that many of the Jewish priests would sing these songs as they walked up the steps to the temple in Jerusalem. But either way, it's this idea of going up to worship God, the idea that God is holy, he is high, he is above us. This psalm here is ascribed to David. He was king of Israel. We're not sure if he was king when he wrote this, but most likely. And so David wrote this at a specific time, but it would be sung by Israel for for many years to come. And here we are still reading it today. And so if you'd please stand, we'll read Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your word. Help us to be more thankful for it today than ever before, the precious gift that it is. Lord, the grass withers, the flowers fall, but your word will stand forever, so help us to stand firm upon it. 
God, take away any distractions. Help me to speak clearly and in a way that is helpful for your people. God, renew our minds, build our faith. Lord, create faith in this room by the power of your spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Psalm 133 is a beautiful song about unity. So that remember, that's what we're, we're talking about, unity. And it's very sad to think that after David wrote this, Israel was divided into the northern and the southern kingdoms, Judah and Israel. Very sad, very sad. There was rampant idolatry, rampant sin, and usually led by the king. Many times we read through the the book of first and second kings and or second kings and even in Chronicles, and it says, So and so became king and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And it, it's just so discouraging. There are a couple of, of good Israelite kings, but few and far between. This, this pointed toward the fact that a perfect king was coming, that Israel needed a, a true righteous king to bring peace. And that, of course, we know now is, is Jesus Christ, the son of David. But David begins this song of unity with a proclamation, with that what the nature of this unity is. Look there at verse one. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. So he says, behold, which means look, pay attention. Actually, look over here. And it's possible this was written when they had gathered together and he was even maybe saying this like, look, like I am with you right now. Look, look around, behold. How pleasant it is and good when we dwell in unity. As I said before, this psalm would be sung by Israelite pilgrims when they were making their way to Jerusalem for certain feasts every year. And they came from all walks of life, all right, just like we do. Yes, they were all Israelites, but they came from different regions, different tribes. Remember, there are 12 tribes of Israel. But their unity, the thing they could all agree on, was the regulations for these festivals. And what they celebrated was their common heritage, redemption from Egypt, God freeing them from slavery from Pharaoh and bringing them into the promised land. So as we think of this idea of unity and coming from all walks of life to gather together, it's important to remember that unity does not mean uniformity. Unity does not mean we all have to be the same cookie cutter, we all have to dress the same and look the same or something like that, which sadly is how many think the church is. And in some churches that, that may be the, the case, unfortunately. But no, God made us unique and so unity in the church is, it includes our uniqueness, but our own individuality never supersedes the, the unity of the brethren. Our personal preferences should never hinder the unity of the church. And so when we gather, we come from different backgrounds where some of us are young, some of us are old. Some of us are right there in between. Many of us have things in common, um, maybe certain jobs we have, certain hobbies, or our political views, certain style of music. And it's good, that's okay to, to gather with people that you get along with and like. And I'm glad you have friends here in this church, and that's a good thing. But what do we all have in common, no matter what? Jesus. We all have Jesus in common. So I can talk to any one of you and we'll have something in common. So that is an encouragement to to get to know each other, all right? As I said, I'm glad you have friends in this church, but don't just always fellowship and talk to the same people when you are here. 
all right? Branch out or include others in your, in your fellowship and in your conversation, especially if it's someone newer. I mean, be even on the lookout for someone. Think if that was you, if you were the, the new person in, in the church. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. David says that unity is good. It's right. It's true. But it's also pleasant. It's enjoyable. Unity is enjoyable. It's not just a duty as Christians, but it should be a joy. Now, we know there are things that are good that are not necessarily pleasant right? So let's going to use this example. Changing a dirty diaper. It needs to be done. It's necessary. And it's a good thing when it happens, right? But it's not pleasant. Paying our taxes. It's good. It's necessary, but it's not pleasant, right? So just because something's good doesn't mean it's pleasant, but unity is good and pleasant. It's true, it's right, and it is enjoyable. That's the result of real fellowship in the church. It's a blessing, and we should enjoy it. I pray that you enjoy when we gather together, that it's refreshing. We'll talk about the refreshment. So now after proclaiming This about unity, how it is good and pleasant. David gives us two pictures to display the pleasantness of unity. Look at verse 2. Here's one of the pictures. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. All right, what's, what's going on here? Well, the Israelite, the original reader, would totally know what he's talking about. And some of us... Hopefully most of us know what this is talking about, but it kind of seems to come out of nowhere. What, what is, how is this a picture of unity? Who's Aaron? Okay, this isn't Aaron Vogel, although he has a very nice beard. No, this is Aaron, and, and what does he stand for? He was Moses' brother, the first high priest of Israel. So David is taking them back. He's reminding them of As I said, God bringing them out of Egypt and how God appointed the high priest and what happened when the high priest was appointed and anointed. The oil was poured on his head, just as it was for King David. Poured on his head, ran down. He had probably a sweet beard. And then onto his robes, just just overflowing. A special ointment. It, It would saturate his hair. And this signified total consecration to his holy service, that he was being set apart as a high priest of God, mediating for the people, between God and the people. And so in the same way, brotherly unity sanctifies us, makes us holy, sets us apart as God's people. We know we are called a priesthood of believers now, and ultimately, Aaron points to Jesus Christ, the book of Hebrews tells us, who is the great high priest. And so David compares the expression of this harmony and unity to fragrant oil. And it was a special oil that was used only by the priests. And this is what he says unity is like. Through the priesthood, God assured his people of forgiveness and blessing. And we know through Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness of sin. And he blesses us. And unity smells good. We sang about uh, our, our songs being a sweet sound to God's ear. But it also should be a sweet smell to one another, to the world. Something sweet about the fellowship of believers in this local body and in any local church something that you can't find anywhere else. Because, friends, we are not just a club. We are not a self-help group. We aren't just gathering because we wanted to and it was our idea. No, we are a family in every sense of the word, but even more so because we are a holy family. 
the family of God. We've been adopted in, brought into the family of God. We are called the church, the bride of Christ, which he died for, the body of Christ. All of these pictures of who we are, both locally, here today, and all over the world, believers are gathering right now. And through the Spirit, we are a part of that gathering. We are the church. It's amazing to think about. And this unity, this is pleasant. It's like the fragrant oil running down Aaron's beard. That's what it's like. Now he gives us another picture of the pleasantness of unity. First part of verse 3. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. What's going on here? Well, once again, the Israelite would know exactly what this is saying. They would get this illustration. So Mount Hermon was a very tall mountain. In fact, it's probably more glorious than Mount Zion. But God chose Mount Zion for his holy dwelling to make the point that where he is, where he chooses, where he dwells, that's what makes it holy. Not because of its earthly beauty. But Hermon, Mount Hermon was and is beautiful. And so like the oil flowing down the robe of Aaron, there's this dew coming from Mount Hermon onto Zion because Hermon's higher and it comes down onto Mount Zion and the, the surrounding mountains. So if there's nothing else you remember today, just remember that unity is like Mountain Dew. It's what the text says, all right? Mountain Dew is in the Bible. But this is the, the kind without sugar and caffeine and all those things. But Mount Hermon was known for its high altitude, its lush greenery, even in the dry summer months because of the rain, the snow. And so this sustained the vegetation throughout the dry seasons. So the psalmist uses this picture of refreshment. It's refreshment, and it represents the experience that the Jewish people would have on their pilgrimage as they came up to Mount Zion. The NIV says this on verse 3, it is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. So during the summer months, basically no rain falls in Jerusalem. It's dry, and that's when the pilgrims would come. So the point of this is regardless of how harsh the conditions were, no matter what it took them to get there, coming to worship God and gathering together was worth it, and it would be refreshing. For most, it took days, and they'd walk. Some, it may have even taken a week to get there. I wonder how many of us would come this morning if we had to walk. So gathering together should refresh us. And it's worth it, friends. I know some of you have had a crazy week, a crazy month. We've all had a pretty wild last year and a half. But God has seen us through. We've made it here today by God's grace. It's a new day a new week, and he wants to refresh us. And so the dew that sustained the vegetation on Mount Hermon was a picture of God sustaining his people as they gathered to worship him in Zion. This is where his special presence dwelt, in the temple, in the Ark of the Covenant. But we know for us now in the New Covenant that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. God has made us a living temple. It's amazing to think of that he would dwell within us. And he is in us through Christ. Jesus said he is the living water. He is the ultimate refreshment. And he says that we should pour out streams of living water. His goodness, his refreshment coming through us. He is the bread of life, the light of the world. And he is sustaining you and me. Do you believe that? It's true whether we believe it or not. And God is sustaining this church. It's not our ideas, our 
strategies or our wisdom or methods. God can use those, but he doesn't need them. It is his wisdom, his sustaining grace. He is the source, and he gives us life forevermore, true life. Think of the the vegetation, the the greenery on Mount Hermon. I should have got a picture up there or something. It's just life. Reminds me of Psalm 1, where it says that we will just flourish if we're planted by the stream and, and dwell in God's presence and in his word. And look at the rest of verse 3. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. There in Zion. But specifically, wherever believers dwell in unity. So this is true for us today. God has commanded this blessing. He commands things. He's God, right? He said, let there be light, and it happened. He also commands that we live in unity, and this unity is a blessing, which gives further blessings. Ultimately, the best blessing we know is eternal life, dwelling in God's presence for eternity. And he gives us a glimpse of that now with the new life he makes in us by the Holy Spirit in Christ through the new birth, when we repent of our sins and trust in him says we are a new creation and he sustains us he makes this happen and so our unity has an eternal perspective this gathering weekly and even sometimes daily as they did in acts this is a picture of heaven it's an eternal perspective just as worship in the temple reflected the worship in heaven. All of the things, all of the the gold lamp stand and all the things that the Israelites were commanded to make and then have in the temple for worship was a mirror in a sense of heaven and the glorious nature of God's presence and how he is to be worshiped in reverence and awe. And so our unity is a picture of Heaven. Charles Spurgeon says this, dwelling together in love, we have begun the enjoyments of eternity. We've only just begun. And these shall not be taken from us. So let us love forevermore, and we shall live forevermore. Amen. I hope this is an encouraging word to you this morning. I know it is for me. But there's another aspect to this. And so we, we went through Psalm 133. But there's another aspect to unity. We know that the enemy of our souls hates this unity. We know Satan loves division in the church, in the home, in a nation. And we know division hurts. It causes bitterness. David knew this when he was writing this psalm. His sons weren't in unity, whether this happened after he wrote it or before, I'm not sure. But his own sons were against each other. One wanted to kill the other. One of his sons wanted to kill him. Pretty brutal. A lot of that was the consequence of his sin. But that reminds us that sin is deceptive. And Satan's all too happy to let us think that that we can control our sinful nature. That... Well, it's not that big of a deal. The devil not only seeks to sow division, but he also sows false unity. So we gotta be we gotta be aware, folks. He's crafty. We don't need to fear the devil, but we need to be aware of his schemes. And so if he won't sow division, he'll sow sow false unity. We need to resist him. And he will flee, the Bible tells us. Don't give him a foothold. Don't let any bitter root grow up among us, the Bible tells us. And when I say false unity, what am I, what am I speaking of? Well, I kind of alluded to it earlier, world peace, you know, that idea. Maybe when someone says something like this, all religions are basically the same. When it comes down to it, they pretty much all really teach the same thing. So 
I mean, there's a, a lot of ways to God. It's just people have different perspectives. You've heard that, I'm sure. Maybe some of you have thought that. Or we don't really have to believe God's word. We're not sure it's even really his word. I mean, parts of it might be. We can't know for sure. But as long as we love each other, because that's what Jesus was all about. Right? We've heard that. Ironically, we only know that's what Jesus was all about because of the Bible. So are we sure we can trust that part? But that's another conversation. So it's, it's true, Jesus was all about love, but what was his, his reminder to us of the greatest commandment? To love God first. That's the, the love that is first important. And then, yes, love our neighbors. But love God first. What, which God? Did Jesus say it didn't matter? No, of course he was speaking of the one true and living God who sent him to die for sinners and rise again. And he, in fact, was God in the flesh. The same God who in Isaiah says, I am God and there is no other. And so it's, it sounds great. You know, let's just all get along, but it's false unity. It's important to note, though, that following Christ will bring division. All right? And why is that? Because the enemies of God hate God, and refuse to repent. And the Bible tells us that's who we all were before Christ. So don't think you're better than them. The Bible says we were at war with God. We were enemies, but while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But those who refuse to repent, who refuse to acknowledge God is the authority that he not only claims to be, but is as creator. This will cause division. Jesus said the world will hate us, his disciples. But it's because they hated him first. And this is hard. It's hard because we like to be liked, right? I like to be liked. It's, it's just how we are. It's selfish. So we don't like to be hated, and we shouldn't purposely want to be hated. But when we stand for, for truth, what God's word says, it will cause division. And so just thinking of Psalm 133, that, that speaks of believers. And I know just now I was speaking of, of how we are interacting with unbelievers, so I don't, I don't want to confuse you. Because God does want us to be united, but even in the church sometimes there will be a separation disagreements. People will part ways. And we see that in 1 Corinthians, Paul says it must happen to, to show who is really in the faith and who is not. But also because sometimes people do just have disagreements. Paul and Barnabas had a sharp disagreement in Acts 15. It doesn't mean one of them wasn't really a Christian. We're not sure. The text doesn't tell us who was right and who was wrong. Most likely, Paul was probably right, but he, they, they both may have been wrong. Paul was right when he confronted Peter, and Peter was mistreating the Gentiles in front of the Jews. You can read that in Galatians. Paul, in the, for the sake of unity, Paul confronted him and corrected him. It seems like Peter responded pretty well. We're not sure, it doesn't say. And so that reminds us that Christian unity does not mean that we never call each other out, all right? We need to do this. This is part of being the body of Christ. And specifically, I mean calling out sin, not just yelling at each other for the sake of, of fighting. But no, calling each other out because this actually promotes unity, because we actually want to be held accountable and love each other in this way. But we must do it in truth and in love, Paul tells us in Ephesians 4. And so remember that when you are confronting someone, to do it in truth and love. Count to 10. Count to 1,000 if you have to. Remember this when you're posting on, on social media. Maybe type it up and then just erase it. 
before you, before you send it. In truth and in love, we need to confront one another, hold each other accountable. And I was thinking about this with what we've been learning in Luke about the Pharisees. So here's Jesus, and he confronts the Pharisees, the, the Jewish leaders, and there's the, the Sadducees, some of the other leaders who the Pharisees weren't getting along with, but they were all too happy to team up against Jesus. And so just think of the, the people watching this happen. There's Jesus, the Pharisees, all this fighting. Jesus was opposing them, although they were really opposing him. Someone could have just said, come on, guys, remember Psalm 133? Behold, how pleasant and good it is when we dwell in unity. Can't we just get along? No, we know Jesus had to deal with that. Because why? The Pharisees were burdening the people. They were, it was wrong. He came to free them, to free us. So we don't compromise truth for the sake of unity. That would be false unity. And we know that according to God's word, some division is necessary because we have to discern between truth and error. All right, there's a line. We can think about that with the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. Martin Luther didn't want to start another church. That wasn't his goal to say, I know how to do everything right and, and the Roman Catholic Church is... No, he wanted to show them, let's go back to God's word. That's why it's called the Reformation, reform. Let's go back to what God's word actually teaches. And when he said that to them, because of their, their power and authority, they didn't like that. And so he was expelled from the church. We see the importance of the early creeds and confessions of the church. When God's word was under attack, just out how it is today, and that we need to not compromise for the sake of a false unity. Many people say doctrine divides, and that's true. And it needs to, because, as I said, truth from error. So with that all said, don't look for opportunities. Don't just constantly be looking for opportunities to call people out. It'll come up. There will be plenty of them. And when those opportunities come, you should humbly take them, but rather let us look for opportunities to love and agree with one another. How about we do that? Wouldn't that be great? And not just put up with each other, not just bear with one another, although the Bible does tell us to bear with one another, but to really love as Christ has loved us. And so unity requires rebuke, Unity requires correction. We know it's true in our families. It's true in the church, and I'm thankful for it. Growing up, having parents who corrected me, I didn't like it at the time, of course, but now being a parent, I, I think I see what they, were, what they were doing. And even in the church, there is a time for expelling people who have refused to repent after patience and grace has been given because they're causing division. And so the fact that they would be expelled would be so that unity can flourish in the body. And so Christ's name can be honored. So it's not about our idea of unity or about us. It's about Jesus. And he is all about true unity. We are one body. He is the head and he unifies us. And he prayed for our unity in John 17, his high priestly prayer before he went to the cross, he prayed for the disciples' unity and he prayed for us, future believers. He says this in John 17, 20. My prayer is not for them alone, the disciples that were with him. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's you, that's me. He prayed for us. Isn't that amazing? And what did he pray? That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So Christ prayed for our unity 
Does that mean his prayer failed? Since we have disunity in in the church and have in many ways for centuries? No, it does not mean his, his prayer failed. It means that his prayer is still being answered. And we have a responsibility as God's people when it comes to this unity. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to look to verse 6. Ephesians 4, verse 1. And Paul gets to this after amazingly laying out the gospel and the fact that we were dead in our sins and that Christ has made us alive by grace through faith. Nothing we've done on our own, but all the gift of God so that none of us could boast. He reminds us of all these beautiful truths. And then here in Ephesians 4, 1, he says this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And we could keep going. It's a beautiful chapter. But verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is our responsibility. So Jesus prayed for unity, but this is our part to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. He has made the unity possible. So it's important to remember, we don't create unity, we maintain unity by God's grace. Jesus made this unity possible. He made peace with his blood on the cross so that we could have fellowship with God, so that we could have union with God. So by grace through faith, we are united to Christ, And we know the Trinity is in perfect unity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In fact, that's what Trinity means, tri-unity. And then think of the unity that God made between Jews and Gentiles. We we just don't really think about that that often because we're on this side of the cross. But this was a big deal. If you're still there in Ephesians 2, um, or in Ephesians 4, go back to Ephesians 2. If you're not, that's all right, just listen. Ephesians 2, verse 12 He says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So God brought together Jews and Gentiles, which is just unthinkable back then to the Jewish people. Christ brings people from all tribes, tongues, and nations to worship him in unity. And this fulfills the promise that was given to Abraham way back before the law was even given, that all nations would worship him. And so when we think back to Psalm 133 that we looked at this morning, the Jews that were going to Jerusalem, to Zion, to worship God. This is for us as well because this is our heritage. We've been grafted into Israel in that sense, spiritually. And this is one aspect of what we celebrate in the Lord's Supper, the communion of saints. That's why we call it communion. We are sinners made saints. We've been brought into fellowship with God and with one another. It's amazing. And so true unity will be pleasant. It should be pleasant to us, but it's also pleasing to God. True unity is pleasing to God. Our unity has a goal, and that's to glorify God. We are his children and parents. We love when our our kids are getting along, right? Or do you like when they're fighting? No, but not just getting along, actually loving each other, as I said. So ask yourself this, what keeps me from 
from true fellowship? What keeps me from unity with other believers? I'll tell you the answer. It's our sin. It's our pride. We, we don't want to get close to other people because they'll see the real me. Or we're afraid that we'll get hurt because maybe it's happened to us in the past. We just don't trust anyone. Well, that's not living by faith. God wants us to be united, so we need to walk by faith. And yes, others will sin against you, and you'll sin against each other. We say it often in this church, the closer we get, the more um, on each other's nerves it, it, we may get, just like any good family. But that just gives us more opportunities to forgive each other, to love each other as Christ loved us. And so we should stick closer than ever before as brothers and sisters in Christ. I need you, and you need me, and we all need Jesus. I'm close with 1 Peter 3.8. He says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. And this, of course, is the mind of Christ, the mind of Christ that has been given to us. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are three in one, perfect unity from eternity past. Lord, thank you for the unity that you have given us in this church. May it continue. Lord, help us to maintain this unity. Lord, by your grace that we would make every effort, that we would forgive each other as you've forgiven us. Lord, help us to truly love one another so that the world will know that your love is real, that you are real. And God, if there's anyone in this room who has not turned from their sin and trusted you, I pray they would do that this moment, that they would realize their need for you, that they are not in fellowship with you, that they do not have real peace, but that you alone have made peace by the blood of your cross. Lord, we've all sinned and fallen short of your glory, and the wages of our sin is death. But your free gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So Lord, may they repent that times of refreshing would come. Lord, you refresh, you restore, you make life new, that you'd give them the power to turn from their sin and to walk by faith trusting you, crucified and risen Savior, and that you'd give them your righteousness. And Lord, you promise to never leave or forsake us. And so for all of us believers, remind us of that, that you are with us and that you've provided this place for us to gather, to be reminded that we're not alone, that you are with us. Lord, help us not to take it for granted. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus, the name above all names that binds us together. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand? <clears throat> We're going to end a little differently by proclaiming our faith, professing our faith through the Nicene Creed. We, we say some of the creeds quite often, but we're going to close with it instead. So I think it's up there. Yep, thank you. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. And before we leave, I want to open those doors. And as many of you that are out in the cafe that can get in here, I want us to close singing Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. But I want us to be in here together. So if you can't get here quick enough, just sing really loud from there. But what a blessing it is to to get to be together this morning. And we don't want to forget all our families out there with, with the children. Yeah, bring them in. Let's sing praise God. Hmm, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You want to say something? All right. Go in God's peace this morning. May He bless you and keep you. You're dismissed.